Word of God, turn with me to um, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And our um, sermon is based on Revelation 16, 12 through 21, but I want us to read Revelation 15, 1 first. And then I'll read um, 16, beginning of verse 10, so we have all of our, our context together. For Revelation 15, 1 says, um, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Well, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1, although that's a good remind you of the gospel I preached. Revelation 15, 1. That's why we start in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless the preaching and hearing of your word that we would be transformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, even by this experience this morning. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Revelation 15, 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. And so just briefly what we see here... Uh, the number seven is a is a formula in Revelation. It's repeated over and over again. There are um, um, seven cycles that we see where we see the same history of the church from the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, the right hand of God the Father, until his return for his church, the end of days, um, where we'll have new heavens and new earth. Um, and so we get different perspectives of this, and we see what God is doing um, spiritually behind the scenes. And so with these bowls that are being poured out, these plagues that are being poured out, what we're seeing is um, it's, it's no longer just um, a, a quarter of the earth that's being destroyed as with the seals or a third with the trumpets, but now the entirety of God's wrath is being poured out on the entirety of the world. And, and the more I'm, I read Revelation, and, and one of the things we're going to look at in the book of Revelation is there's nothing in Revelation that's not in the rest of the Bible. So we had to be very careful of that. You don't want to come up with some new theology um, that you only can see in the book of Revelation, unless that's what something that is there. But what we see is that everything that we see in the book of Revelation, you can see happening somewhere else. It's just put in a different way and from a different perspective. Now, one of these things... Um, is going to be the fact that it does appear that as time goes on, well, let me um, quote um, Simon Kistemacher, who's a comment, writes a, a commentary on uh, Revelation, and then we'll read 16, 10 through 21. He says this, Satan is waging war ever more fiercely as he sees his time, which he knows is short, elapsing. The closer he comes to the end, the fiercer he plunges into battle. But God is bringing together all the rulers of the world and their people for the purpose of defeating them. So Revelation chapter 16, beginning in verse 10, the word of the Lord. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, grumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, 
fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. The word of the Lord. So as we look at verse 10, and I wanted to, to start there again. We sort of ended there last time, just looking at it a little bit. But it's pouring out his bowl, this fifth angel, on the throne of the beast. Now, what we, we see here is we're going to see this false trinity again rising. And what we see here is the, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Before, uh, this is the first time he's called the false prophet. It was, he was the second beast arising from the earth. But now we see that he's being called the false prophet. So you have this false counterfeit trinity that's going on. As, God is set, as Satan is setting himself up as the god of this world to be worshipped as opposed to the one true God. But this fifth angel, who we do see, this is all coming from God. He's the one that's taking these angels and and using them to pour his wrath out. So it isn't just God responding to things that are happening. God is in control of all these happenings. So he pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast. So we have the dragon who's Satan is this power behind the powers, but the manifestation of these powers on earth first is seen as this beast, which is demonically inspired political power. That's what it is in the book of Revelation. So don't miss the fact that not all political power is demonically inspired, but we understand political power is wielded by sinful men and women, which is why in this country our founders set up certain checks and balances to try to keep that in check as much as possible, Uh, but there is such a thing as demonically inspired political power. And so what we have to recognize is, as if you're a student of history, if you wait too long to recognize what's going on and you allow that political power to gain too much control, then it's a little too late to do anything about it. But God is in control. And so the question that Revelation is answering for us especially in this particular passage this morning, is what are we supposed to do in the meantime? What's our reaction? What, how should we, what should we do? But this bowl is being poured out on the throne of this power. And its kingdom, the beast's kingdom, is plunged into darkness. And that's what you have. And this is what will happen um, in the last days. And we also see it happening um, throughout the history of of the world here, especially during the time of Christ. So one of the things that you see as you study um, Old Testament prophecy and and even New Testament prophecy is things that occurred in the Old Testament battles, um, events, uh, judgments, they were what we call temporal. They happened in time. They, 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 they happened at a particular point to a particular people. But at the same time, they also point towards, so they're typological. They actually symbolize a future battle that will take place, a future judgment and final judgment that will take place. So that other judgments throughout time are meant to show the world, and we see this particularly with the trumpets, are meant to show the world that there is a final judgment coming. It's not that God let everything just go along fine and dandy, and then one day he says, oh, by the way, y'all are all wicked and evil, and there's going to be a judgment, and everybody's like, what? (laughs) It, it, It won't be like that. Indeed, what we'll see is, in verse 11, well, the beginning of the first, the middle of verse 10, people gnawed their tongues in anguish. So they see these things that are happening and they curse the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They do not repent of their deeds. So this is what is being set up in Revelation is to show that as God is sending these things to happen for the purpose of people seeing, hey, there is evil. There is wickedness. There are things in this world that need to be judged. And God is saying that, well, what you need to recognize is that same principle set up within you. So we had to be careful as the church, not yet glorified, but filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't just preach to people outside the walls. We preach the gospel to ourselves. We also are watching ourselves lest we too fall into temptation because we're still clinging to the flesh in a lot of ways. The world, the flesh, and Satan are our three enemies, and they don't let us go until the final battle and the end and the glorification of the church. So what we need to recognize is the fact that these 
things that happen that are difficulties in the world are judgments, but they're also a call to the believer and to the non-believer too to wake up and see that they need a deliverer. But instead, what the non-believer does is curse God. But what the believer should do is to bless God that in the midst of these things, he is still holy and he is still right and he is still good. So when we see verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now it's generally understood that this is a summary statement about the sixth bowl and it shows that the judgment is initiated by the angel sent from God and then 13 through 16 spell out these specific details. Okay, so verse 12 is he pours out this bowl in the great river Euphrates. What in the world is the river Euphrates? So there's still a river Euphrates. And from time to time, guess what happens to the river Euphrates? It dries up. And guess what happens on all the social media outlets? Here it comes. The end of the world because the river Euphrates is drying up. Surely this is the end of the world. Well, I would just say surely hey, that's a good thing to be thinking about. Why would anybody think the drying up Euphrates has anything to do with the end of the world? I don't know. Let's turn to the book of Revelation. Let's find out. But then the next thing to do is, what's the, what does the river Euphrates represent? What does it symbolize? Because remember, this is the book of the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It's an apocalyptic literature. It's not everything to be taken as this is actually literally what is going to be happening, that there is the actual river Euphrates will actually dry up. Hey, it might. I mean, and it does. And it might allow some kings to come across and attack that region where Israel is, the north and the eastern borders of the Euphrates. If you look in the, the uh, I think it's Genesis 15, and the promises made to Abraham, you say, I'm going to give you the promised land. A part of the border that he mentions is the, to the river Euphrates. And that dries up, the enemies of God can come in. And so we have to say, what does Jerusalem, what does Israel represent? Because it's a real place. What does it represent, though, in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation? And it's the dwelling place of God on earth. It is where his holy mountain is. It is where Zion, Mount Zion, J Jerusalem and then we see later that the Jerusalem from above will come down. We even know that um, in the Old Testament, as we see the, the tabernacle and these things being built, that Moses said that he took the design for these things from things that he saw in heaven. So what God is giving us, that he gave us in um, the Garden of Eden, and what he gave us with the tabernacle and the temple and these things, is an image of heaven. And that... He will defeat all of his and our enemies. Where Adam failed in the garden to defend the garden and his wife, Jesus Christ finally defeats the serpent in the desert after fasting, putting himself under um, much more difficulties than Adam had, and also, therefore, defending his wife, the church. And so this river dries up is symbolic for the fact that God is doing something to allow the kingdoms of the world to be able to have some victories or to come forward. So in 13 through 16, we see a little bit more of the spelling out of the details here. In verse 13, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. All right, so let's break this down for just a moment. So first, it's coming out of the mouth. So that means that this is these are things that are being spoken, um, ideas that are being communicated in some way. Uh, the dragon, as we've seen in the book of Revelation, is Satan. So this is Satan. He's the, the great dragon. He's the one behind all these powers. And then um, the beast is, as we've said, demonically inspired political power. And then the false prophet. Now, the false prophet is an interesting um, character because um, the dragon empowers the beast. And then the false prophet causes people to worship the beast. <clears throat> and so what we see the false prophet 
is is religious, philosophical, scientific, psychological support of the demonically inspired political system. Okay, psyops, <laughs> this guy kind of thing that can all sorts of uh, governments in the world. You see some that are that are religious in nature, even, and then you see some governments that use uh, religious. Or, and you can even see in our country how the scientific establishment has been used to support certain things that the government is deciding to do. And then you've got like, well, wait a second. Uh, what about these scientists? What about these philosophical directions? What about the, you know, so what we see in our country right now is, is being torn apart, becoming more chaotic because what's the religion? What's the philosophy? What's the science? What's the psychology? What's the thing behind the thing that this country is based on. What, where do we get our morals from? Where do we, what's the basis for laws? What, what are we doing? And Satan, as the song says, laughing with delight the day the music died. And it's just like, you know what? This country's never been a theocracy. This country's never been perfect. This country's always had flaws and errors and things. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to do the same thing that Satan does in your life. Let's, let's examine your life a minute. How far short do you fall? Unless you're proud and pompous and you think you're just all that. Well, let's use all these problems. Let's use all of these errors. Let's use all of these past sins to defeat you and hold you down and keep you from doing anything good because you are not worthy. Okay. Now what? Well... I watched the six million dollar man when I was young. <laughs> we will make him stronger. We will make him faster. We will make him, you know, he was an astronaut, gets in a bad wreck. They spent six million dollars putting that man together. I know people living today that probably spent six million dollars on a hip <laughs> and they can't run 60, million, 60 miles an hour like the six million dollar man could. But, you know, it's that idea. We will build back better. You know, we will make him stronger faster. We will recreate this country this world in the likeness and image of, and there's the question, who are we following? And the Satan and the beast and the false prophet have going out of their mouths three unclean spirits like frogs. That's a weird thing, but as I kind of have a little bit of a frog in my mouth, <coughs> my throat actually, um, it's a croaking Thing. In the Bible, frogs are unclean. Uh, there's only two places in the Bible where frogs are mentioned. Now, when they mention clean and unclean animals, uh, the, um, the characteristics of frogs puts them in the unclean category. So if you came into a contact with a frog, you were now unclean. You had to do these ceremonial things. You couldn't, certainly couldn't eat frog legs and things like that. Uh, they were unclean. But the only two places you see frogs mentioned is here in the book of Revelation and, of course, in the, uh, the, the ten plagues of Egypt, the, the plague of frogs they were going for. There were uh, a particular god called, um, I, I was it was, his name was Hopi, which maybe I've made that up or Hopi or something, but it just makes me remember, you know, that's what frogs do, but also called Hect, H-E-Q-T is how it's spelled. It was a, um, one of the gods of resurrection, one of the, the main gods. They've come up out of the, the water and stuff, so one of the gods that God was judging was this god of Egypt and saying, I'll send a plague of frogs. It's also one of the few plagues that the magicians were able to recreate. Uh, the, the demonically inspired rulers of, uh, of Egypt were able to conjure up their own frogs, which, I, which again, is just hilarious. Okay, because there's a plague of what? Frogs. Help me, oh magicians. Oh, we can make frogs too. You're driving the monkey to the airport. That's not what we want. We don't want more frogs. We want the frogs to go away. But the magicians are just like, oh, we can make frogs too. You're not helping. And it's just like God is just mocking them. And now we have this reappearance of, of this demonically inspired trio who... Satan knows his time is short. He cannot defeat and has lost the battle with Christ. But now we've seen in Revelation that he's focusing his effort and his ideas and all of his wrath on the church. So it can be a bit, 
what's the word I'm looking for? It can be kind of arrogant of the church, and it can almost seem like a conspiracy theory to think that all these things, evil things that are happening in the world are happening to attack the church or happening to keep the church down or happening to make things harder on the church because that kind of makes it all about us. And the book of Revelation says, hey, it is. Satan has made this all about us. Now, he doesn't like any human being because we all are created in the likeness and image of God, but the church is being recreated into the likeness and image of Christ, and he knows he can't touch us, but he can fire darts. He can still uh, have difficulty. We live in a cursed, fallen world, and we aren't removed from this. And so God uses all these things that Satan would throw at us as trials in our lives to perfect our faith. It's got to be infuriating. You know, it's be like some movie where this guy is just trying to make things worse for this other person. And everything he does only makes it things better. I mean, there might be a movie like that. It'd be a good thing. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him crash his car. Here's the example that came to my mind. My best golf game ever. I broke 100. One time, I was amazed how good you had to play to break a hundred. I would hit that ball and it off into the trees. It would go, but it would hit a tree and go right back into the green. I was like, "What are we talking about here?" And then I was like, "I don't know." I would just hit the worst ball, but it was like the wind would blow and bring it right back in. It's like Caddyshack type thing. I was just like, "Yeah, it's just incredible." And for the believer, it kind of works like that. That no matter what Satan is throwing at us, even when it knocks us down desperately. God uses that to teach us more about ourselves and him and the world and, and things such as this. But the false prophet, these things going about like frogs, um, he's just croaking this idea. You know, if you've ever been out at night and hear the frog, you know, it can be, depends on types of frogs. You know, they, <laughs> they things can be loud, but it's just this this croaking thing, but what it does is, these are 14, these are demonic spirits performing signs. Now, that's an interesting thing, but there's something that they're doing to make it appear as if they actually have power and they actually are doing good things as far as the person that's uh, uh, getting the benefit from these things. And, and they go abroad to the kings of the whole world. Okay, so this is what he's saying. There's that there's this demonically inspired, this demonic power goes out like these unclean frogs and going out to all the kings of the whole world, these rulers, these kings of the whole world to assemble them. And that's the word synagogue right there. It's, it's, it's not trying to say it's like a Jewish synagogue, but it's that same word for assembling together um, for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So now this assembling together is this idea of um, getting them all on the same page. Now, they might all have different reasons for uh, why they are opposed to a particular thing. Um, who knows what they are? Because these demons are going out. All they're trying to do is array every, all these kings against the church. So, you know, one of the things is, is the Olympics is going on in China. Uh, one of the things that we see... Uh, with a lot of the missionaries in China, some of the churches that are being severely persecuted in China, pastors being arrested in China to and being put in prison without representation, without uh, anybody knowing where they are. Um, China is severely persecuting the church, severely persecuting the church. And so whenever you hear the Olympics or see the Olympics or see anything like that, Pray for the church in China. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's, it, there's evil going on. Not just in China, but in the world, there is evil going on. Don't be fooled by these things. Pray for our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world where they're being persecuted for their faith. Especially while we call it the day here. So they're being assembled they're all being put on the same page. The symbolic river of the Euphrates uh, is drying up so that this protection for the church uh, is gradually, as time goes on, it's like, why are you letting them in? Why are you taking down the hedges of protection? Why are these kings all being able to be assembled 
and being able to all come in at the same time <clears throat> is for their destruction. God is arraying them and gathering them all together at one time, at one moment, to finally push so hard and so far that he will destroy them in the end in one fail swoop. And that will be the end. But verse 15, we have this little interjection. And your translation may have put it in parentheses there to help you see that it's, it, it kind of interrupts what's happening. Behold, <clears throat> I am coming like a thief. This is God speaking. Now, how's a thief come? He's all sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you least expect it. I saw something on Facebook uh, yesterday or this morning or sometime. Flipping through it, it's like 40 things Steve teaches us that they're looking for um, to be able to break into your house. You know, what are they looking for? You know, and one is like your lights are not on. I thought, well, that's interesting. So you kind of make all these little parallels with, you know, spiritual uh, readiness, spiritual alertness. What are we supposed to be doing? Make sure you are, you know, be awake. Is, you know, they don't mention that. Well, don't go to sleep at night. Well, okay, that would, you're taking it too far with that. But what God is saying is, but if you want to really be ready, if you knew what time the thief was coming, and see, and that's the trick, isn't it? You just don't know. So you kind of always have to, that's why we lock our doors, that's why we do different things. Um, you don't let your mail stack up over a couple weeks when you're gone. Don't keep putting on Facebook that you're going to be gone for two weeks. You know, things like that, that people can see and they, like, they get in and things. But the main thing that he's saying here, is, as we'll see in a couple other places real quickly, is that I'm coming like a thief at a time when you don't expect it. We read elsewhere, such in the, as in the days of Noah, um, people were going on as if life was, was normal. But he says this, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So again, that makes us think about Adam and Eve, you know, what they did and how they ended up being naked and exposed. Um, again, because he wasn't protecting the garden like he was supposed to. He wasn't keeping um, the, the garden as he should. He allowed the serpent to, to be there and deceive him and, and, and Eve and they ate. And, and fell. He said, don't do that. <laughs> Be, you see what Jesus did. He, he spoke the word of God. Satan says, hath God really said? And then what Jesus says is, this is what God said. And he quotes the word of God to him. So you have to have the word of God hidden in your heart. You, you need to be clinging to the word of God. But there's this interjection. And sometimes God does this in between the sixth and seventh seal. Um, the sixth seal is the end of the world. But then he says, wait. And then you have the sealing of the church. So that's where the 144,000 are sealed. And there's this protection of people. Um, and then here again, there's a word for the church, for our protection. What are we supposed to be doing while all these kings are being assembled for this great battle against the Lord? And in verse 15, there's this blessed art. It's a benediction. It is the third of seven benedictions in the book of Revelation. It's interesting how these sevens are woven throughout the Bible and in the book of Revelation. Um, the first blessing, I'm just going to look at these first two. Uh, verse 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in them. For the time is near. The time is at hand. And then 14, 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So there is blessing and there is reward. And now in 16, 15, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not be naked and exposed. And again, the idea of keeping your garments on is you're going to sleep at night. You put on your night clothes. I don't even want to think about how some of y'all might sleep. But, you know, you, you got to be ready to get up and go. Um, sorry, TV shows are coming to my mind this morning. There was an Archie Bunker episode showing my... I, Maybe it was a rerun. I don't know. But there was an argument between himself and, and Michael Stivick, his son-in-law that he couldn't stand. And the argument was, um, he, was he watched, Archie was watching Michael 
take off his shoes. And what he did was he took off one shoe and one sock. Then he went to take the other shoe. And Archie's like, what are you doing? Everybody takes off both shoes and their both socks. He said, well, I don't do that. He said, why don't you do that? He said, well, if there's a fire. He says, I've got one shoe on. I can go hopping out. You're going to have both socks. You're going to be walking out of there in the wet. <laughs> so they have all these little arguments about, you know, how are we doing these things? But it's like, and then you sleep in such a way, and there's these stories that you read in some of these martial arts books and things where it's like people who live on the edge of, you know, worrying about an attack might happen at some point. That you're always sort of, you know, like the policemen, they'll say, you know, they always sit in a restaurant facing the door or something like that. You watch, all the, the firemen that like to back their cars into the fire, into the fire spot, into the parking spot so they can like pull out real quick if they need to leave. Uh, things like that, that that people are doing. And he's saying like live your life in such a way that you're not caught off guard when these things start happening. Stay awake, stay alert, be aware at any point, any time these things can be at work and probably are at work in some way around us. So we're told in First Peter, I think it is, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to destroy. And in verse 14 here in Revelation, we see all the kings of the world are being assembled for battle on the great day of the Lord God, the Almighty. I love that word in, in, in Greek, by the way, it's theo to pantakrator. It means um, all powerful, pantakrator. It just sounds like a powerful word. And that's what he's saying. Almighty is God, pantakrator. And in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the day of the Lord is frequently used and it's the end times judgment language. And often these other smaller judgments throughout the world, he'll say, and there's going to be a great day of the Lord when I will defeat all of the enemies of the earth. And that's what this is pointing to. So if you can find the prophet Joel and turn to chapter two. <coughs> I'm going to read Joel chapter 2, 26 through 32. And I want you to, to hear these prophecies and these readings from the Bible in light of what we're being told in Revelation about the kings being battled, uh, the kings being assembled for this battle of Armageddon. And we're going to look at Armageddon in just a second. So Joel 2, beginning in verse 26. Um, he, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now, this is told that this is Pentecost in the New Testament. This is the, the creation of the church. <clears throat> Verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So we see there is a remnant. There are those who are being saved. There are those who are being sealed. It's the call to the Lord. It is the church. And then turn in the New Testament to 1 Thessalonians. So this is in the, the, the letters of Paul are all put together here. The T's are in numeric and alphabetical order. So if you go to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, <coughs> verse 1. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. 
But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And then it goes on from there. And then in Second Peter, so if you just go more towards the book of Revelation. It's after um, James and Hebrews, those larger books that you run into. Second Peter chapter 3. Jesus himself uses the analogy of the thief in the night when he's telling people to, to be aware that judgment is coming, I am coming, I come like a thief in the night. So it's a, a, an, an idiom that's used a lot to help people think about these things. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning of verse 1, Now this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged, flooded with water and perish. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. <clears throat> now, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is how we are to live our lives at this particular point. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. And he goes on from there. So then back to Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. And they assembled them, the kings, that he's gathered all together, at the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. It's just terrifying, the word Armageddon. I don't mean to mock it, but it is one of those words that's like, there's movies called Armageddon. There's, you know, Armageddon means kind of like the same thing of uh, apocalypse. And, uh, you know, there's, what's, the, what's the coming apocalypse? That's the destruction thing. What's Armageddon? That's the final battle where it's going to be a big battle. And who's going to be involved in it? Well, somebody, it's going to be China, and it's going to be Russia, and it's going to be these other countries and stuff. It's like... Stop it. There's, there, there is no nations of Satan versus the nations of God, where we are Christians who have now won the political wars. We've now taken over certain countries in the name of Jesus Christ. He is reigning with us. We are suited up with our spiritual tanks and rockets or something, I don't know. And then we got all these others over here and there's this big battle that's coming and it's like there's going to be this thing that happens. <clears throat> and I'm not trying to mock it because there are people who believe in a futurist interpretation of Revelation that this is indeed what happens. But I plead with you to let the rest of the Bible inform the end time stuff that we know. And it's just not what we're told to do. We're not told to take over a country for Christ. I mean, it's happened. People tried to do this in the past. It doesn't end well. Whenever the church gains political power, 
it's the same thing that works for any, you know, one political party. You know, Republicans are in power. Let's get all the authority we can. Good. Well, guess what? Now the Democrats are in power, and they have all that power. Good. Now let's gain all the power we can so we can do what we want. Good. Guess what? Democrats are in power more. There's the Republicans. Now you have all that power. Well, let's get all the power, you know, so that what we have is we no longer have leaders who see themselves as being under the law. But we see leaders who are like ignoring the law, trying to twist the law, trying to use the law so that we see the work of the false prophet, the beast and the dragon at work, even in our halls of power to say, yes, exactly. This is what you want. You need more power. You need more political power. Don't worry about truth. Don't worry about being right. Just get more power and then you can do what you want. Tolkien did this wonderfully with the ring of power. Uh, the, they would tend to, it's like they tried to give Gandalf the, the ring of power. And he's like, no, don't do to me, Frodo. You know, you can't take it. And then uh, Galadriel, this other you know, the elf queen, sorry if y'all don't read this stuff. You know, she says, and she, you know, going, uh, Frodo offers her the ring and she's like, I can't, she, for a moment, she's like, this is, this is wonderful. Instead, you know, you'll have this, I can't remember what she says is a good line though, or she's just going to be this magnificent powerful person or, or whatever she is and then she but she doesn't she says i have passed the test i will now become less kind of like john the baptist he must become greater i must become lesser but it's this power that if it's not holy spirit gospel power and the church is wielding it then satan can use it for his own purposes and we had to be very careful with that god has instituted authorities in this world as ministers of God. And that's what we're supposed to try to hold all governments accountable to is being under not a theocracy, but where we see, and here's the problem. Only in the Bible do you see what truth is. Only in the Bible do you see on what is the basis of right and good. And if you replace that with people doing right in their own eyes, then you had the book of Judges. And that's not where we need to be. But what we're told to do is to live lives of holiness. So Armageddon, what is it? It's a Hebrew word that they've taken and transliterated into Greek. And it har means mountain. Some of the English translations took, take a little H off for some reason. I guess it's like herb instead of herb, but it's still written there, but it's Har Megiddo, which means mountain of Megiddo, which some people say, well, that's the area of Megiddo. And I don't, we kind of run out of time here to get into some of this, but Megiddo is an area, there were some major battles that were fought there, but there's no mountain there, it's a plain. And so a lot of people like, they try to, so it's just spiritual. Well, it is a spiritual place where there's going to be battles. But Meredith Klein um, has written about this a lot, and he's an Old Testament Professor Westminster Gordon Conwell RTS ordained in the OPC. He says it should be interpreted as Mount of Assembly. That, and I won't get in. Talk to me about it later if you want to about how um, it actually is in the Hebrew Har uh, Megedon, meaning Har Megedon. Anyway, too much to get into with Hebrew. But where you see this in the Old Testament, you never see the area of Megiddo as being any kind of end times prophecy. But you do see this Mount of Assembly. So let's just, in closing here, look at Isaiah 14. So if you can find your prophets, you get to chapter 14. And what we see in chapter 14 is a taunt against the king of Babylon. And Babylon in Revelation is the worldly, ungodly system. And what we see here is that ungodly system being taunted. So Isaiah 14, verse 3. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service in which you were made to serve, so they've been in captivity, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Now, this is a famous verse uh, passage in, in Isaiah. How the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. Yahweh has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers. Now, this is the end time judgment that we see happening in this battle of Armageddon. They struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypress rejoices at you. The cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Sheol beneath us is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you. 
all who were leaders of the earth. It raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. All of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as us. You have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. The sound of your harps, maggots are laid as a bed beneath you. That's, that's, that's pretty. And worms are your covers. How you are fallen from heaven, O oh, day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down. You're being taunted. You're a day star. Oh, yeah, really? Right. You've been, you've been cast down. How you are cut down to the ground. You are laid, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Descending of the mountains. They're taking the place of God. You've said you were going to do this. You're going to be above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. Which Meredith Klein and others agree with him that that is Har Megadon. This is where the kings are coming to take the throne of God. They are coming to finally defeat God and take his place. And so once they are gathered in Revelation 16, the seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air and a loud voice comes from the temple of the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a great earthquake such as there had never been since man on the earth. So great was the earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. It's like we use the word decimated. It actually means to divide into ten parts. But you just <laughs> they use three parts like that in this word. And the cities of the nations fell. God remembered Babylon the great. See, this is the connection between the king of Babylon and the actual Babylon, Satan, who is coming. And he made her drink the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath, and every island fled, and no mountains were found. Great hailstones, a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hell, because the plague was severe. End of the world. Judgment of the unrighteous. And as we go forward in these next chapters, we're going to see detail of how God is destroying these different powers that are currently being assembled and arrayed in this great, massive, last-ditch, final attack on God's people and God himself, and God simply destroys them in the end. And so this is to give the church encouragement to stay awake, put on the armor of God. Don't let the world drag us down. He's coming as a, as a thief. Satan is the thief, the liar. And when things happen in this world, when things are thrown at us, the world curses God. We cannot do that. So we have to be careful that when the world is dragging us down, that we don't seek the world's solutions. That the weapons of our warfare are not worldly weapons. That he gives us communion. He gives us himself. He gives us his spirit. He gives us his word. He gives us the church. He gives us prayer. He gives us great, powerful things. But if all we think of as blessings for the church is material wealth and prosperity and easygoing and political power, that can all be manipulated, manipulated by Satan because of the great resentment and the great pride that we can get. We have to make sure that we're clinging to Christ so that when he gives us the two great sacraments of the gospel in the New Testament, it's washing and cleansing of sin and giving you something to eat for the battle to get you to move forward so that he is with us. So let's pray. Father God, help us to stay awake. Thank you for your warnings. Thank you for your encouragements. Thank you for all that you've given us. And we pray as we come to your table that we will be able to celebrate the fact that we're in your house. We're your people. And no matter what happens in the future, we will forever be with you in the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.